Hey, thanks for joining me for the scripture exploration. Father John Muir, it's good to be with you. For those who don't know, I'm the pastor of St. Thomas Aquinas Parish. And um, every week we get together and spend a little time in this digital format, simply looking at the scriptures and trying to reap some of the wisdom that they have to offer us. So let's uh, let's ask God's blessing on us today. I'm excited about today. I'm going to do something a little bit different today. And I'll tell you what that is in just a moment. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for this wonderful season, not only of, the, of this new year, but also of the new liturgical year. Help us to um, be more and more enthusiastic about listening to you speak to us, especially in the sacred scriptures. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, I want to throw you a little bit of a curveball this week. So normally what we do is we take a look at typically the Sunday uh, readings. Often the gospel, uh, first reading, sometimes we focus on the second reading. But uh, at Thomas Aquinas, our feast day is coming up this coming um, 28th of uh, January. And so we're moving, we're taking advantage of a beautiful liturgical uh, option to move our patronal feast day to the nearest Sunday. That's exactly what we're doing. So we're actually not looking at the gospel of Mark, which is what we, what basically most parishes are doing around the whole world. We're actually looking at uh, the Feast of Thomas Aquinas. And we're pulling readings from what's called the Common of Doctors of the Church. And I was looking at those, and they're just, they are a beautiful. The second reading oh, that caught my attention from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, um, and it's it's the uh, the reading on uh, the goodness of con- uh, consecrated celibacy for the kingdom of God, how there's an undivided heart, and Paul is saying, I... Um, I, I wish that you were you were like me, un, unmarried, so you, that you can be anxious about the things of the Lord. Instead of focusing just on that reading, though, what I want to do is actually just zoom out and just do a, a quick scan of the whole letter of St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. The reason for that is because typically in these readings, we really hone in on just a few short verses, but it's, it's good to, to look at a whole book or a whole letter and, because you get the kind of an overarching view of what uh, God is saying and through the author in that letter. So we're going to try to do the first letter of the Corinthians, the whole letter in just about 20 or 25 minutes. So crack out your Bible, open up first Corinthians. And um, we're just going to look at the overall structure of the letter and pull out two or three of the key uh, points of what uh, Paul is proclaiming in this uh, letter. A little background on it. First of all, uh, Paul went on three missionary journeys and on one of them, in the, around the year 51, he went to Greece. And he goes to Corinth, founds the church there. Corinth was a pretty bustling economic center. Think of it as almost like the Las, um, Las Vegas meets New York of the ancient world. Not that big, obviously, but it was an economic center. It was a cultural center, a lot of art there. And like a lot of cities, they had a lot of... Uh, issues with immorality and a a strong, strong pagan influence there. And Paul founds a church there in 51. And now five years later, he's hearing word that there are some divisions in the community and there's some immorality happening. So he writes this letter to respond to that. But what, what I think you'll see as we take a look at this, that he takes this occasion and then he uses that occasion to weave seamlessly a real proclamation of the mystery of the, uh, of the, of the gospel and of the uh, Christian faith. So uh, that's what's going, going on here. I'm, what I'm going to do is just point out sort of the basic structure of the letter and, and hit some highlights to the chapters as we go. Very beginning of the letter. Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. Paul, right? The name means little one. It's the name he takes after... As Saul, he encounters Christ risen from the dead on the road to Damascus. Paul, Paul, Saul, Saul, says the Lord, we know from the Acts of the Apostles, why are you persecuting me? Paul gets this new name after this experience of encountering the risen Lord, goes to Arabia for three years, and eventually launches on his apostolic mission. He says, I'm an apostle um, by the will of God. In other words, I didn't choose this myself. I wasn't even selected by one of the 12 apostles. It's God himself who has sent me. That's what apostle means, apostolos, where we get the word post office, right? He's been sent, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, right? This man, 
uh, Christos means the Messiah. He's Jesus. He's Messiah Jesus. This new David, this new anointed one. So there's a lot packed into that first line. Paul, who's, in, who's encountered the risen Lord, has been sent by God, and he's an apostle of Christ Jesus Christ, the, the anointed new David, new Messiah. Uh, and he's writing to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Those sanctified in Christ Jesus. The, the importance of, the, of sharing in the holiness of Christ is going to be uh, important. Paul's going to deal with some moral issues, but he's going to help them see that he's not calling them just to virtue. He's calling them to life in Christ, union with Christ. Together with all those in every place who call in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's speaking to this local church in Corinth, but he's also very mindful that the church is not simply these scattered pockets around the, um, the Mediterranean world. That, that's a common misunderstanding. Even today, people think that the early church was just this like loose federation of little, um, little local churches all over the place. That's not how Paul sees it. The, the, the church is a, as a unity, a body, which we'll see in this later in the letter, those who in every place call on the name of our, our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, and then grace and peace to you, he says. Grace, um, charis, is a share in the very life of God. Peace, a shalom, um, uh, irene uh, in, uh, in the Greek. That's where you get the name Irene, right? Irenic. Um, grace is a share in the life of God, a, the gift of God, um, which can only be given as a, as a the, the, God's life can only be given as a gift by God himself. And peace. So, Peace is not simply an absence of violence or conflict, but it's a, it's a shalom in Hebrew. It's a kind of life or balance that obtains from proper relationship to God and to each other and to the self. It's kind of a rightly ordered creation. Adam and Eve fall out of that peace. Christ is going to bring people back into that peace. It's a more dynamic image than just the like peace in English, like peace. Oh, I'm just, I just, I got a headache with all my kids running around. I just want some peace and quiet. Uh, shalom or peace um, that Paul is speaking of here is, is is this participation in the new creation, which is which is a, a kind of a theme very much behind um, in the background of the first letter of the Corinthians. Okay, what what Paul is is, is going to address them, and he's going to point out that they are um, blessed by God, not lacking in any spiritual gift, but falling into these uh, divisions. Some say I belong to Paul. Some say I belong to uh, Cephas. Some say I belong to Christ. He says here in verse um, uh, 12 and and following. But instead of just sort of castigating them, Paul now is going to switch into the foundation for the whole letter. In verse 18, he says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And then he's going to move into this little uh, talking about the, 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 f- the foolish of the world. What's true wisdom? What he's saying here is, look, you're, you're falling into divisions because you're focusing on human wisdom. You're, just at, you're not thinking according to the wisdom of God. What's the wisdom of God? It's the word of the cross. <laughs> the, the cross. Paul's going right here for the, 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 the kind of the kill right off the bat. Um, he, what he, he proclaimed to them five years before, which is the foundation of this community, is the word of the cross. What happens on the cross? Um, it's, it's where this Jesus Messiah is crucified. It's where he uh, gives his, his life as a ransom for many. And um, the, the, the theology of the cross is, comes out in other places in, in, in uh, Paul's letters. Um, but what Paul wants to see, go to the end of the letter here. He says, consider in verse 26, consider your call, brethren. Not many of you were wise according to the flesh. Not many were powerful, not many of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God has chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. He chose the low and despised of the world. Even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no flesh might boast in the presence of God. 
He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts boast in the Lord. Paul's not easy, but, but, it, but there's a, a logical structure here. You've been given every gift in Christ Jesus, but now you're falling into these divisions. So Paul's saying, um, but the word of the cross is the wisdom of God, right? You're acting on human wisdom, which just falls into these partisan politics. The wisdom of God is, he, he, he chooses what's lowly and foolish in the world. And what's that? Well, it's human beings, right? And on the, the word of the cross is where the Son of God goes down, does this foolish act of love, going to the lowest place, the most ignoble place, place the, the, the most powerless place on the cross, so that those who are called to him might receive through his act of, through the word of the cross, through his act of submission to that foolishness that we might receive and the Corinthians might receive God uh, from God, this our life in Christ Jesus, whom God has made our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. In other words, this, the, the wisdom of God has been given to us, the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the redemption of, of God. In other words, you, you guys want to boast? You're not boasting enough. You should be boasting more, not in your little human politics, but in what, in the unity that Christ has given to you who did not deserve it, who didn't deserve his grace and the life that comes from him, nonetheless given as a gift. So that's the foundation, um, the, the folly of the cross um, preached. Now, if, if you know, we can think, well, back in those days, it was easier for people to, to believe in a crucified Messiah, son of God. And now it's hard. You know what? It was hard then and it's hard now. In fact, it's so hard that Paul's going to say, you cannot receive this without the power of the Holy Spirit. One time I heard Scott Hahn say, the question isn't why don't people believe in, in Christ? The question is, why does anybody? And the answer is in 2 Corinthians. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so this is where, oh, I'm sorry, it's not, yeah, it is, it is chapter two. Paul's saying, look, when I came to you, I didn't come proclaiming to you testimony of God in lofty words or wisdom. I desired to know nothing except Christ Jesus and him crucified. But then he says, um, but his speech and his message were not in plausible words of wisdom, like human wisdom, um, like demonstrative proofs, syllogisms, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. And then he's going to say down here that we impart a secret wisdom in verse 7, secret hidden wisdom. And you think, oh, does that mean that this is only accessible to people in a special class or elite class, a kind of Gnostic gospel? No, far from it. Go down to verse 10. God has revealed this wisdom to us through the Spirit. And then, he, you know, what, then he talks about what searches the depths of a man, his spirit. What searches the depth of God, God's spirit. Now we have received in verse 12, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is from God. Why? So that we might understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And we impart this words, not by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit. Interpreting spiritual truths to those who possess the spirit. You remember Jesus says in one of the gospels, no one comes to, the, uh, comes to me unless drawn by the father. How does the father draw it? Through the Holy Spirit. Paul's saying, if you accepted the gospel, you accepted it not because it made sense to you in terms of human terms, but because the Spirit of God was given to you so that you can understand and say yes to this mystery. The, you know, the whole theme of, of, the, of this is going to emerge later. Is this just like, that doesn't make sense and it's just faith is just receiving things on blind faith. No, later in the, in the gospel, Paul is going to res respond to that. Hopefully we get there when he's going to talk about tongues and prophecy, he speaks about how much the mind is better than tongues, that the, the mind has to play a role in uh, faith. Um, it's almost a precursor of John Paul II's faith and reason are like two wings of the Holy Spirit, of the spirit by which the human spirit rises to God. Okay. Uh, in chapter three, Paul's going to speak about, okay, the word of the cross, that's the foundation by which God has given these gifts. 
The Holy Spirit is the means by which we receive and understand what God has done for us, not human wisdom, but divine wisdom. Now he's going to start to look at what is this, what is this done for us? What is this gift through the word of the cross that God has done for us? And that's chapter three. And this is where he says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? This is what is, ha- this is a, one of the two master analogies of Paul in this letter, that the word of the cross, the power of the Holy Spirit has made those whom, who Christ has called to be his temple. Second great analogy will be to be his body. The temple, and oh, how cute, how, how sentimental, but he's, he's drawing on the Jewish tradition here, right? The Old Testament. The temple was not, this is not sentimental stuff. How nice, we're God's temple, how peaceful. No, the temple is very specific. It's God's dwelling place. It's where the new creation uh, abides. The temple was meant to be like a new garden of Eden, a new creation. Inside the temple, there were images of like trees and plants and uh, animals and things. And then there's the Holy of Holies where God dwells. So it's like a new garden of Eden where the creation and God come back together in this glorious harmony. And it's the temples where sacrifice is offered, where the priesthood of God is functioning. In other words, you're the temple of, the, of God. So this is where creation is made new through the proper sacrifice that gives right praise to God. And now you're thinking, okay, um, Paul, what do, you, how, is this, what do you mean, Paul, that we're going to somehow offer a sacrifice that's pleasing to God? And, um, th- and Paul is going to, um, to get there. Now, before he gets there in chapter 4, he's going to take this temple uh, imagery and, and remind you of who he is in the temple and he and the apostles. They're not just anybody. They're not just any like um, church going Jewish person in the temple. They are servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries, kind of like the way the high priests and the Levites and the priests would have been. Now, Paul and the apostles play this role. They're entrusted to be, uh, to be stewards of the mysteries of this new temple that the temple in, in Jerusalem was just a foreshadowing of. Okay, so in, at the end of that chapter, Paul will say, and I'm a father through the preaching of the gospel. So the, the offering of sacrifice, the being stewards of the mysteries, and the preaching is going to be part of what it means to be a steward of the mystery, um, f- trustworthy to God, and then, and then to be good steward for those who are members of that temple. Now in chapter 5, before he gets to what it, the sacrifice that happens in this temple, in the Eucharist, he's going to speak about two problems. Chapter 5 is about sexual immorality, which defiles the church, defiles the temple. And then chapter 6 will be about lawsuits or these petty divisions among believers. And one way, I think, just to see the context of that is that if you're part of the true temple, if you're part of the new creation, if you're sharing now in God's righteousness and holiness, sexual immorality is a huge problem for that. Uh, we tend to th- think of sexuality n- not in a religious sense in the secular world, but in the ancient world, it was it was common in pagan temples where there would be temple prostitutes. It would be a way that you would commune with the God of that uh, temple. And um, what Paul, and Paul practically is responding also to the sexual, sexual immorality that's rife in the community, um, most notoriously one of the members of the community who's sleeping with his um, father's mother, his own mother-in-law. What Paul's saying, though, is this is a this is a moral problem. But what I want you to see in ch- chapter five, verse um, eight or seven, rather, is Paul uh, Paul saying, "Look, you're committing this huge. He's committing this huge sin." And then he says, "Your boasting's not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens all the dough?" Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be new dough as you are really as you really are unleavened. For Christ our pas our Paschal Lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore let us celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I think a lot of Catholics would hear that and say, look, when Paul, this guy's committing these terrible, grave evils against the natural law, sh- shouldn't shouldn't you say this is unvirtuous, and you should try to be a good person. Don't break the natural law. Don't break moral laws. That's not what Paul says. He says, he's using the image of the Passover. He's saying, look, celebrate the festival 
what is festival? The new Passover. What the 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 old Passover? They would take out the the leaven from their houses, and they would only eat unleavened bread. So le leaven was a sign of spreading corruption. The way yeast spreads through the dough and makes it rise. So evil spreads through the community, spreads through the family, and it affects the whole thing with its evil. It spreads. So so Paul's saying, don't. Don't think the sexual immorality is just a private thing. It will spread through the community and reap this terrible destruction. So he says, cast out the evil, not so you can be virtuous, but so that you can celebrate the new Passover with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Um, beautiful. Um, this, by the way, is the backdrop of where Paul's going to go in just a few chapters about how Sec morality, including sexual morality, in a certain way, maybe especially sexual morality, and the Eucharist are so deeply um, at odds with one another. But here he's laying the kind of uh, theological backdrop. Oh gosh, we're already 20 minutes into this, so let me, let me see if we can get to the end here. Um, I'll pass over the lawsuit part uh, and go into um, how in 7 he's going to, this is the one that got me to want to focus on first Corinthians here. He's going to speak about kind of a theology of man and woman, which is, there's a lot of beautiful stuff here, but I'm going to pass over it. Just all, all, all we should say here is Paul sees that now in the mystery of those called to be in the temple of God through Christ, or called to be members of his body, marriage and sexuality take on more, not less of a significance. The, the forgiveness of Christ of sins um, doesn't take away the, um, the the Christian obligation to live a moral life, but rather enhances it, and it will it'll take on a deeper significance, basically a symbolic uh, significance. Um, am I going to find the uh, the quote here? Um, let's see. It's one of my favorite quotes from Paul. Uh, no, no, it's actually it's it's. Oh, it's actually towards the end with the, the, the passage on the head covering. Anyway, what I love about chapter seven is Paul is saying, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious, right? Without, the, the, the worldly way is always being anxious. Should I get married? My marriage is a mess. It's causing me all this anxiety. Uh, I'm not married and I'm freaking out because I need to find a spouse. Paul's saying, be at peace. Be at peace. Um, your, mar your marriage is, it, there's going to be a level of anxiety in your marriage. So that's just normal, um, but don't don't use the gospel as a means of like of like running away from your spouse, but also accept where you are in your life um, now. And there's that beautiful call to cons uh, consecrated celibacy for the kingdom. Okay, gosh. Now let's you know I well did I pass right over the over the Eucharist? No, I didn't. Oh no, let's fast forward up to. Um, 11. And actually that's, that's what I was just, uh, thinking of. Um, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Let me just point out what a lot of people don't like looking at, but it's the part on head coverings. And, um, here, it, here it says, uh, the man ought not cover his head since he's the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Everybody, this is Hebrew symbolism. It's not about the equality of man and woman vis-a-vis -vis each other, which one has greater or lesser worth. Paul is a Jew. He knows that man and woman are created both in the image of God from the book of Genesis. But within that equality, there is a kind of symbolic complementarity. And here it, here it is. Man, um, man is the image and glory of God. Woman is the glory of man. What that means is, symbolically, in their unity and equality, man vis-a-vis -vis woman symbolizes in a particular way God. Woman vis-a-vis -vis her husband symbolizes man meaning humanity in its re receptivity and openness, capacity to bear life. Um, that has nothing to do with a, a man and woman's equality or virtue or who's better than worse than the other. It means that in their relationship to one another, there's a, there's a kind of symbolism of God and symbolism of humanity happening, almost in a dramatic way. Love to say more about that, but that's one of my favorite uh, lines here. And it's and Paul's saying it now because he's about to now shift metaphors from the temple of God to the church being 
the, the one body of Christ. Um, but before he gets there, he gets to what makes us become the body of Christ, which is the Eucharist. And that's in uh, chapter 11, the institution Paul's going to re now um, retell us the institution narrative uh, from when he says, this is what I received from the Lord in uh, 1123. And then he'll speak about discerning the body of the Lord and how dangerous it is to eat or drink unworthily without discerning the body of, of the Lord. And he even goes so far as to say, with, if you eat and drink without discerning the body, you eat and drink judgment upon yourself. That's why many are weak and ill and some have truly died. The body there is the, the, the body and blood of Christ present in, the, um, in the, uh, the chalice and the consecrated bread. At the same time, it's also discerning the body of which you're a member. Um, the, the body of Christ in the Eucharist is deeply interrelated to the body of Christ in the church. Christ has one body, right? But it's, it's, it's present in different modes, Kind of like the way that like I could be present to you uh, physically. I could be present to you through a video. I could be present to you through a uh, text message. I could be present to you um, through a um, telephone call. Christ's body is present to us in the Eucharist, truly, substantially, really, um, under the appearance of bread and wine. And, his, and the, he's present to us in his ecclesial body. And he, there's a great line in theology, which sums up what Paul is saying here, which is, the church makes the Eucharist, right? Only the church as the body of Christ can say, this is my body. And at the same time, as Christians receive the Eucharist and the liturgy is celebrated and the Eucharist is consumed and worshiped, it builds up the church. It builds up that unity in the body of Christ, which is why it should be no surprise that in chapter 12, Paul now will shift to, in this one body now, the Holy Spirit is going to give life. He says um, in a... Where is it? He, he, he's... Oh, yeah, the beginning of 12, he says, look, you know that when you were heathen, you were led astray by to mute idols, however you may have been moved. In other words, before you were in this mystery, you were led by idols. You were led by the powers of this world, right? And you had no control. Just, they, they would bring you to these terrible, dangerous places. But he's saying now, in the spirit... You are led by the Spirit. And what are you led by the Spirit to do? To, to build up the body of Christ in these different ways. Now he's going to start to speak of the different members of the body of Christ, like feet, hand, arm, eye, etc. Um, and he'll say in verse 27 and 28, there's apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, workers, healers, hel uh, helpers, administrators, speakers of tongues, etc. And then finish that chapter with the beautiful call of, but love, the Holy Spirit, is, is what inspires or infuses the whole body with its um, uh, with its life and its purpose. That's where we find our purpose. The Holy Spirit leads us to live our lives as members of the body of Christ, always in love, but in, our, in the particular call that God has given us to do. He's going to end the letter in, um, with a, a little kind of epilogue in 16, but in 15 he speaks about the, goes back to the kerygma to kind of, kind of sum up the whole mystery that he's teaching here. They Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, raised on the third day, that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, and then to the 12, then appeared to 500, and then to Paul. And then um, and then he and then sends out the apostles, and Paul's one of these that are sent out. It's a little summary of the creed, isn't it? Then he's going to end with um, the resurrection of the dead. That all of this, everything he's accounted here, the word of the cross which is only receivable through the power of the Holy, Holy Spirit, which has made you a temple where God dwells and sacrifice is offered, which overcomes all division and all pride, which brings about this new creation where the sacrifice of the Eucharist is offered and received, which builds up the body of Christ, unity in the body of Christ, by which the Holy Spirit will now work through the whole church as a living spiritual organism. All for what purpose? So that for this resurrection from the dead. That's the purpose. Without the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, the word of the cross means nothing. But with the resurrection of Christ from the dead, the word of the cross is the inauguration of something 
uh, true and powerful. And you can see here in verse uh, 22, he says, in, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. That's the gospel, right? In Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. This is a new creation, a new Adam. That's what the, the, all the chapters have been um, building to and are working uh, towards. And here's this beautiful summary line. When all things are subjected to him, to Christ, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things under him, that God may be everything to everyone. Probably a better translation of that will be all in all. Unity, peace. Right. Go back to the beginning of the letter. Grace to you in peace. Grace and peace, charis and irene, um, shalom, the life of God inf infusing, healing his creation, drawing all his, his, his creation out of death and into life, all through the power of the cross of Jesus, the spirit of God, at work in the church and then through the power of the sacraments, and finally working um, in the life of the church to draw all things to God in this um, unity, which finally is manifest in the resurrection of all things. Um, where the perishable nature puts on the imperishable and mortal nature puts on the immortal. That's in the end of chapter 15. Um, is that helpful to you? It's, uh, that was fast, obviously, right? In half an hour, we just went through the, the whole letter, first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. It's amazing how Paul takes the situations that he's facing in life, which are difficult and frustrating, and sees in them an opportunity to uh, rediscover and teach the gospel, the basics of the of the faith, the word of the cross, the work of the spirit, the church is the temple of God and the body of Christ, all working, especially through the Eucharist, to draw all things to um, God. If only we could have that same grace in our lives. That's a good one to ask for, that God would give us the grace in the daily events of our lives to be more like Paul, to rediscover and to proclaim these great basics of the good news of the word of of the cross. God bless you and thanks for joining me, everybody. Have a great week and happy Feast of St. Thomas Aquinas. God bless you.